I think maybe, maybe that would be okay. This is CNN. Will New Hampshire Democrats look kindly on a neighbor from Massachusetts? Can a Democrat incorporate some Republican-sounding ideas into his campaign? Have the tribulations of Governor Bill Clinton aided his primary opponents? Welcome to Newsmakers Saturday in Washington. I'm Charles Bierbauer. We'll ask the former senator from Massachusetts, Democratic presidential candidate, Paul Songas. From Washington. This is Newsmaker Saturday with Charles Bierbauer. Seven years ago, Paul Tsongas left the Senate and went home to Massachusetts to battle cancer. Last year with that battle won, Tsongas crossed the border to New Hampshire to battle for the Democratic nomination and against George Bush. I'm a social liberal, and I end up in this uh, campaign as a fiscal conservative, as a candidate who says, no to the middle class tax cut, no to the tax credit for having children, no to all the goodies that George Bush, most of them, that George Bush talked about last night, because I know what it means to live in economic decline. But Songus is also not quite cut from a Democratic mold. Paul Songus separates himself out from many of the other Democrats in a fashion that creates a much more of a business orientation. Songus entered the race with little national recognition, but the hope his New Hampshire neighbors would be good to him. Songa says he's gotten near the top of the New Hampshire polls on his own, not because Governor Bill Clinton is having troubles with allegations of marital infidelity. If you, look, if you just look at where it came from, when I went up to 27, that came right into the day, and I stayed there, despite what's happening. So I'm not picking up anything from what's happening to him. Senator Zongas, thank you for joining us. Joining me is Gloria Borger of U.S. News and World Report. Uh, New Hampshire primary, just over two weeks away. The <coughs> polls, most of them show Governor Clinton and you at the head of the pack, maybe five to seven points separating uh, you and the governor. Do you consider yourself neck and neck with him? Well, I think he's clearly the front runner. Um, has been for um, the last uh, couple of weeks, but. We have held our own. I think most people's uh, early calculation that once others got into this race that our support base would fade has not been the case. But clearly that um, it is a kind of neck and neck race in that respect. But still you, you take the position of being the favorite neighboring son from Massachusetts uh, and you had the big uh, head start on the rest. Shouldn't you be better where, than where you are? Well, when we started off, the, uh, the fact is that was something like 7%. So if you look at what is the base by being in a neighboring state. I think that would be the number that you would look at. And I think the perception was um, very clearly that um, I've been out too long, that a Greek from Massachusetts is not a viable national candidate, and we lost support from that. But I think what's happened in the last uh, couple of weeks is that we have moved, and that movement is not a function of being a neighbor, <clears throat> it's a function of people's analysis as to how the campaign is going. Let's talk about Governor Bill Clinton and his problems lately. Uh, you've spoken a lot about your personal battle with cancer during this campaign and how important your family was to you. Last night during the debate, Jerry Brown brought up the issue of the relevancy of these allegations of marital inf infidelity about Bill Clinton. He said it was relevant. Bob Carey said it's not relevant. Where do you stand on that? Well, you know, I think it's no secret that Bill Clinton and I have become pretty good friends uh, <laughs> during this campaign. And so I'm not a, a uh, objective uh, uh, viewer here. But what I really get concerned about is that this begins to play down all the other issues. Remember the, the Cuomo watch days when <laughs> wherever you would go somewhere, the question would be, is Myro Cuomo going to run? So all the other questions got lost in the shuffle. The same thing has happened. You know, the issue's been raised. It's been talked about. Let's put it aside, get on to the other business. But is it relevant? in judging someone's <coughs> character as a presidential candidate? Well, the fact is no one knows what the facts are. So, re you know, what is relevant to what set of facts? And it's, I think that's the issue. I would be more concerned, the one thing I did talk about was the remark vis-a-vis -vis Mario Cuomo. You know, I'm an ethnic, and so I was particularly sensitive to that, but he apologized, and let's get on with it. Bob Carey made an issue out of the apology, saying that it wasn't good enough. Uh, <laughs> What did you think of that? I mean, should Mario Cuomo have come out and attacked Bill Clinton the way he did? And, and I thought Bill Clinton's apology was legitimate. I mean, 
Bill Clinton's the front runner. So people are going to take shots at him for that fact. I mean, the debate that uh, we had last night, I got attacked because I'm moving in the polls. When I wasn't doing well, nobody attacked me. And that's simply the nature of the beast. And you suggest you're moving in the polls not because of Clinton's problem, but because of issues you've laid out there? Well, and if you just leave aside New Hampshire, if you just take the national polls, um, in early January it was at 2%. Now, <laughs> you do 10 months of campaigning to get to 2%, you're not making very much progress. And it went from 2 to 10% in a matter of two and a half weeks. Now, what happened during that period of time was the debate, which was the most important. We just jumped 10 points um, in New Hampshire at that period of time. And secondly, the recognition that there really is a difference between my economic programs and the others, um, and the New York Times uh, lead story two weeks ago. Let me ask you about your economic programs then. The State of the Union, the President made his usual pitch for capital gains tax cuts, and you want cut capital gains as well. That's a very Republican-sounding thing, isn't it? Where, the, do, where do you differ? George Bush's original capital gains proposal was, you buy a racehorse, you buy an art collection, you will get a capital gains tax if you then sell it and make some money. Now, what does that got to do with competing? That is an ideology. It is not an economic policy. So my capital gain says you only get a capital gains tax cut if you invest in securities. What I'm trying to do is get money to flow into the engine of our economy, which is to the manufacturing base. Secondly, you only get it if you hold that security long term. So we're getting patient capital flowing into that base. And the third point is I pay for mine dollar for dollar with an increase in the highest taxes on the wealthy. So the wealthy who invest in this country are better off those who don't get hurt. How much do you raise the tax on the wealthy, and what do you consider wealthy? 200000 um, It would be dollar for dollar, but I would be willing to go up as far as that takes us. Some would argue that a capital gains tax cut like this would generate revenue. I don't make that assumption. So I'm willing to take it up as far as it has to go. The guess at this point would be probably that it would, you would have to put in three, four billion dollars and raise the tax uh, accordingly. Let's talk about the middle class now. We've talked about the wealthy. A lot of Democrats in Congress, as well as a lot of your colleagues running for the presidency, are pushing for middle class tax cuts. You don't want to do that. You say that it would be dangerous for the economy. Why are so many Democrats then doing something that you believe is dangerous? Listen, I, I get the same polls they do. I sat in those meetings. <clears throat> The middle class is where the Democrats are going to win in 1992. Fact one. Fact two, how do you appeal to them? You give them something. What are we going to give them? We're going to give them a middle class tax cut. Does that generate the, the economy? Does that make the, the people uh, find jobs? No, that came right out of the media consultants, came out of the pollsters, like Japan bashing. So are you suggesting that the Democratic leaders in Congress are doing this because they're pandering to polls? You know, I'm not, I don't want to use the word pandering, but the fact is th there is no support <clears throat> either among economists or in terms of the editorial writers for a middle class tax cut. If you're going to spend $30 billion, at least spend the money to generate jobs in the economy. So let's take the $30 billion. You can get a capital gains tax cut targeted. You can get an incremental investment tax credit. You get Head Start. You get extended employment benefits. What George Bush did, as the Washington Post pointed out, was a lollipop budget just all these giveaways and the democrats are bidding with him and they're both going to escalate the cost and the, and the impact on the deficit is going to be tragic on friday the uh, congressional democrats slipped out of town to try and uh, get their heads together on what they should do in response to president bush's deadline for enacting some of these economic things by march 20th they don't seem to have come up with quite uh, a unified position here uh, congressman foley speaker foley saying yes we'll pass these packages and and Senator Mitchell suggesting they ought to just go head-to-head -head with the president. Where do you come down on that? Well, my view is you pass what makes sense, and you don't pass what doesn't make sense. I mean, it's not a matter of a blanket endorsement or a blanket rejection. For example, I agree with him on the line-item veto. I think that's an appropriate step in the right direction. So rather than taking a kind of ideological stance, let's take them one by one and go down the list. I mean, I thought the president was very clever. You say to Congress, you pass this by March 20th, whatever that date was. And if you pass it, then I get credit for it. If you don't pass it, then I run against you in my presidential campaign. So that was not an uh, inconsiderable, I think, uh, political genius. We call that a win-win situation. How, what do the Democrats, how do they respond? Do they go head-to-head -head with them? 
what they do is they nominate a, a Democrat who's not part of Washington. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of that, a lot of times you've said that your rivals, some of your rivals, would be Democrats who would take the country off an economic cliff. Who were you referring to? Bill Clinton? Well, let me say that um, I refer you back to the New York Times piece uh, two weeks ago. And what that piece said was that all the other Democrats are offering all these promises without paying with one exception, and I'm that exception. And I live in, in the business world. I know what it's like out there trying to compete. The only way you're going to get this economy back is to invest in the manufacturing base of this country. Very quickly, you and Bill Clinton are the front runners. Why should somebody choose you over Bill Clinton? Because I know how to fly this economic plane. I resisted the middle class. You know how nice it would have been for me to get up and say to the middle class, I'm going to give you a tax cut. I mean, I'm not stupid. I, mean, I know the impact of saying no to something like that. So I think people can hear that and conclude that maybe he's telling us the truth, number one. Secondly, I've spent seven years out of here. So I've been out in the real world, in the business community, so I have a sense of what you have to do to bring the economy back. Senator, we've got to take a break. We'll be back with more questions for Paul Songas. Stay with us. risk can be dealt with, it can be managed. It can even be turned to your advantage. To do that, you need a partner. A partner who understands it and can help you turn a world of risk into a world of opportunity. Merrill Lynch, we're bullish on the future. More dependable than most, this umbrella. For it comes from the travelers and its independent agents. Your partners in insurance protection you can carry with confidence. From life insurance for individuals, to property, casualty, and health insurance for owners of businesses large and small. Open in case you want the team that delivers, the travelers and its independent agents. You're better off under the umbrella. Tonight, Bush's State of the Union address, was it more politics than policy? And the campaign battle heats up the airwaves as candidates hit the television trail on CNN's Capital Gang, 7 Eastern tonight. I got into this race before any other Democrat did by far. George Bush was at 91%. Why did I do it? Do you think I don't know that being great for Massachusetts is not a problem? Is this purpose to what I'm doing? You mentioned that yourself. Obviously, the reference to, uh, to Governor Dukakis's campaign in 1988. Have you put that issue pretty much aside? Do people keep bringing it up? You did, actually. Well, um, I've learned that it's in people's minds, so you better deal with it up front and acknowledge in your own head that this, this is something that people are going to have to think about. And for me, given the fact that, um, that you have the 88 experience, um, there are a lot of people who said to me when I first started, forget it simply for that reason. So I have to differentiate myself from everybody else. So they say to themselves, he has the best economic program by far. And even if he is Greek, even if he is from Massachusetts, he's the only one that can take us out of this dilemma. You've convinced yourself you're electable. I mean, not, I've never lost, really, I've not never really lost an election. I was never told I was electable in any of those elections. So I'm used to this kind of situation. Um, if I didn't think I could win, I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here. Well, speaking of electability, a lot of Democrats uh, inside Washington, admittedly, have been very worried that given Bill Clinton's problems, that suddenly some new candidate was going to have to come into the race uh, because you were not electable. I mean, how do you feel about that, them essentially saying that you're part of the warm-up team and then we'll let the big guys out on the field uh, if Clinton falls? Bring them on. 
Well, why do you, do, does it get you angry? Do you feel why they're not taking me seriously? Not one vote has been cast in New Hampshire and suddenly they say that I couldn't possibly be the nom nominee? Well, you're talking to somebody who tried to change the party. And I told the Democrats back in 1980, the way you're going, you're going to lose because you are not consistent with where the American people are going in terms of economics. So the fact that people have argued against, I mean, these, some of these are friends of mine, so it's not a personal relationship that has trouble, but in fact, we disagree strongly on where this party should go. If I were embraced by people who have a different view, that would be more strange. I don't get upset because when I started this race, I came to Washington and I met with a lot of my <laughs> former colleagues and, and their comments were such that they thought it was a foolish venture and they cannot understand why I'm doing well. But I've been through this before. When I ran for the Senate, I mean, everybody dismissed me in that Senate race. And I won the same thing for Congress or County but Commissioner. But how will you do well in the South? They argue you're doing well in New Hampshire because it's, uh, it's your backyard. What about in the South, for example? Well, in the, in the uh, CBS uh, New York Times poll, I, I went ahead of both Tom Harkin and Bob Carey in the national poll. So, I mean, so something's taking hold. Ultimately, everybody in this country has a stake in our economy. And if people in the last analysis believe that I, more than any other Democrat, and more than George Bush, know how to bring this economy back, they'll forget the rest of it. So the regional nature, I mean, sure, I'd rather be from Georgia, <laughs> given all things being equal, to run in this race. But it doesn't change the validity of my ideas. Do you have any reason to think or any, uh, any intimations that other candidates, other Democrats, will get in the race after New Hampshire? Well, no, I don't think it's a matter of getting in after New Hampshire. I think if Bill Clinton continues to do well, um, that will still be there, and these other Democrats will stay out. So um, I think there, you have a lot of people who are going to run around and raise money and, and make contacts. That's already taking place. But um, that may be a wonderful inside Washington uh, game. But I can tell you, if someone jumps in, let's say a month from now, and says, I am the chosen um, fair-haired child of the Washington establishment, I would love to have that person in the race with me. Let me turn to health care. President uh, <clears throat> Bush uh, hinted at his plan uh, in his State of the Union address on Tuesday of this coming, up, uh, coming week. He's going to unveil it. Uh, do you think health care is going to be a critical issue in the campaign in, in itself? I think it's going to be, a, it already is a critical issue. I but mean, everybody is saying we've got to do something. Yeah, but what's going to happen is at some point, it's like the economics. I mean, it took until three weeks ago for people to begin to differentiate between the economic plans. Now, last night in the debate that we had was the first time that you had a real discussion about the differences between my um, health care plan and Bob Kerry's. And now you have George, B <laughs> George Bush. No one in the business would consider George Bush's plan viable. That was simply a political statement put out national health care in the uh, speech so people felt you addressed it. Uh, uh, let me suggest a certain similarity. Your plan is based on a, on a market-oriented, competitive, private side health care, which sounds very much what we expect to hear from President Bush. The difference is in how it works. What George Bush will do, he will give uh, you and I a tax credit for health care. So that means that Paul Songas goes up in the marketplace to try to figure out what is the best health care program, and I'm supposed to negotiate with a provider. Under my plan, the government sets the standard, but then you have these large entities that compete against each other to provide that health care and bring down the cost. The notion that an individual has any capacity to negotiate or really understand the differences between these major programs is not accepted in the medical community. What's the cost of your plan? Our, our cost, it doesn't cost anymore. I mean, the group that I put together, I said, I want you to bring everybody in and don't bankrupt the country at the same time. So what they came back with was this managed competition. Same thing Business Week. I mean, Business Week is certainly not a liberal magazine, but they have endorsed the same concept as the New York Times has. Speaking of cost, why isn't anybody talking about the deficit in this campaign, which is at about $400 billion right now? We're hearing talk about lots of wonderful programs, full funding for Head Start. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, you know, if you add it up, where's the money coming from? Well, I think it's time the press did add it up. Because I've heard my, my colleagues talk about all these things that they would provide and all the tax gimmicks, they're going to tax breaks, they're going to provide, and that ends up with a massive debt. And at, at some point, the press is going to have to sit down, 
item by item and figure out where exactly the deficit will be under these programs. And my policy is very simple. I don't do the giveaways. So the tax base remains strong, and I'm, and I'm going to do the freeze. I mean, I did that when I was in the Senate. I passed a, a uh, budget freeze in 1984. Just to move very quickly to trade, which is another key issue in this campaign, uh, Senator Bob Carey has run an ad in New Hampshire uh, talking about getting tough on the Japanese. Is he a protectionist? I, mean, I did a response ad about three days later. We've got less than a minute, Senator. And said, Japan's a problem, sure. We're the problem. We have to go out there and compete with Japan and do a better job. Well, See, you've stunted my well, answer. Now, we've got, now we've got 30 <laughs> seconds left. Put yourself up at Camp David. How much assistance would you provide Boris Yeltsin? I think you have to keep those people going. You know, if you're going to spend trillions of dollars when they're a threat, I think you have to give them the wherewithal to get through this winter. Um, but I particularly have to give them the talent. I talk about an executive Peace Corps to take people who have that kind of experience and go over there and spend a year or two of their lives there like I did in the Peace Corps. Senator Sangus, thank you very much. Gloria Borger as well. I'll be back with one more political perspective in a moment. My glasses are always too tight or too loose. Why can't they ever keep their fit? You don't have to put up with glasses that don't fit anymore. Because now Lens Crafters has so many new ways to make glasses more comfortable. Now Lens Crafters brings you better fit for greater comfort. Lens Crafters glasses fit your snug points with features like new snug fit hinges that hug your head and won't lose their gentle hold. Now that's what I call a great fit, and they'll stay put. Lens Crafters, better fit for greater comfort in about an hour. In Switzerland, Ricola has been soothing sore throats and relieving coughs naturally for over 60 years. Ricola is a blend of 10 organically grown alpine herbs and natural flavors, providing pleasant tasting natural relief. Ricola, the natural choice for soothing sore throats and relieving coughs naturally. Usually, when you send flowers out of town, you give the order to somebody who takes a cut. Then he passes the order to somebody else, who takes a cut. But now there's Flowers Direct that actually lets you speak to a florist in the town where you're sending the flowers. Flowers Direct, or we cut, is the middleman. Call Flowers Direct now, 1-800-621-2121. The New Yorker. It's been called the best magazine in the world, probably the best magazine that ever was. See if you agree. Call this number and get 52 weekly issues of The New Yorker for just $25.95. That's $65 off the cover price. Week after week, the quality of The New Yorker speaks for itself. So call 1-800-257-1257 for 52 weekly issues of the best magazine in the world. Yes, The New Yorker. On another political front, President Bush has been meeting with Russian President Boris Yeltsin up at Camp David today. The two presidents were at the United Nations Friday, and Yeltsin seemed to fit comfortably into his new circle of, shall we call them, comrades. Amid all the praise for the new Russian direction, the name of Mikhail Gorbachev never seemed to come up. In the bad old Soviet days, that would have meant someone had become an unperson. Remember Nikita Khrushchev. Now even the Russians seem to practice politics a little bit like everyone else. One day you're in, the next day you're out. We've seen our last U.S.-Soviet summit, but we could be in for frequent Bush, Yeltsin, Russo-American reunions. In fact, they've announced up at Camp David they plan to meet twice more this year. More on the Yeltsin meetings tomorrow on Newsmaker Sunday when Frank Cessno and Wolf Blitzer interview Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney. That's at 10.30 a.m. Eastern and also tomorrow in a special edition of Newsmaker Sunday, a conversation with the U.S. Ambassador to Russia, Robert Strauss. That's at 5.30 p.m. Eastern here on CNN. For Newsmaker Saturday, thanks for joining us in Washington. I'm Charles Bierbauer. For a transcript of Newsmaker Saturday with Charles Bierbauer, send $4 to Newsmaker Saturday Transcripts, Journal Graphics, 1535 Grant Street, Denver, Colorado, 80203, or call 1-303-831-9000. Your comments may be sent to the same address.
What if you suddenly found that up to 50% of everything you owned had vanished? Gone to pay taxes. Fortunately for your family, there's Merrill Lynch estate planning and business succession services. So this is a nightmare that doesn't have to come true. A message from Scott Tussin. Are you confused by cough and cold medicines that contain sugar, alcohol, and sodium? Yes, may I help you? Yes, my father is a diabetic with a heart condition. Which cough medicine would you recommend? I would suggest the Scott Tussin sugar-free cough and cold medicines. Mm -hmm. They may be used by individuals with diabetes, high blood pressure, or a heart condition. Thank you. You're welcome. Scott Tussin sugar-free cough and cold medicines, the perfect choice for the entire family. Sunday, President Bush vows to reduce U.S. weapons. Yeltsin does the same. How much should the stockpiles be cut? Defense Secretary Dick Cheney on Newsmakers Sunday, 10.30 Eastern on CNN. Hi, everybody. Hope your weekend's going where his... Well, here's Steve Koch with an update on the weather. Steve. Hi, everyone. How about your weekend? Let's get into it. Our forecast weather map. In the western areas of the U.S., this is the big front that brought the big winds yesterday to the coast of Oregon. Today, the winds will be uh, letting up, and you'll find some inclement weather, cloudy skies, lots of rain, and some snow topside. Record warmth again for the second day in a row will be found in the central plains. As many as 64 cities yesterday set record highs. Looks like a repeat today. Sunny conditions to the southeast and inclement conditions to the north. There, it's snow and some very strong winds, particularly along the coast of Maine and down into eastern Massachusetts. Near blizzard-like conditions from the strong storm that is now moving towards the coast. Eventually, later on tonight, tomorrow, it'll start moving away and things will begin to get back to normal. For tomorrow morning, this is what we still uh, expect. Some snowflakes along the eastern coast of Maine into eastern Massachusetts, but the interior section's beginning to let up on the snow. Temperatures will be a little bit warmer during the daytime hours. Showers move into Texas from Mexico, but most of the country will be dry. Here's a rundown of a few cities and their forecast for later. Have yourself a wonderful weekend. The news continues here on CNN. Thanks, Steve. Health Week up next, and we will take a look at our top stories, including the latest on the summit meeting at Camp David. Broadway and the heart of rock and roll comes Buddy, the Buddy Holly story, the sensational hit musical that's raising the roof in London, Australia, and now in theaters across America. The star that had him cheering, the songs that had him bopping, the story that went down in history. Come down for the wildest night out since 1959. Live at the Des Moines Civic Center for three performances only, February 4th through 6th. Call and charge your tickets today. I remember the first time I tasted frozen yogurt. It was A.E.'s Peach Twist. What a surprise. How could something that tasted so good be so good for me? I tried the other brands. They looked like a bargain. But they tasted like a bargain, too. Artificial flavors and colors, higher fat and sodium. I miss my fuzzy peaches. So I'm back. It doesn't get any better than A.E. Taste the difference. Here's some free advice from a car dealer. Do not buy a new car until you check out the automotive industry's best-kept secret. Subaru, thanks for watching. 1,050 people on the line. 1,050 people on the line right now. This is a deal. At this very moment, you could be missing out on the most remarkable sales event ever. A Home Shopping Club Bargathon. Wonderful. I think it's fantastic. I think it's the most fantastic buy. Bargathon, where prices keep dropping and dropping. When I saw this, I just really flipped. You could be missing a Bargathon right now.